Hello everyone, welcome to another exciting journal club with Vestibular First. I'm Helena Esmond and tonight we have two very special guests, Dr. Debbie Feinberg and Dr. Mark Rosner, both excellent clinicians in their own right and I will let them individually introduce themselves a little bit more. So I am a neurovisual optometrist um, and I started practicing in 1983 and uh, I'm specializing right now in helping patients with dizziness, nausea, imbalance with walking, many vestibular system symptoms uh, with small units of prism or micro prism. Excellent. Hi, I'm Mark and my background is a little bit different. I practice clinical emergency medicine for 30 years and during the last 10 to 15 years, I was working with Debbie to help her set up this new specialty that we call neurovisual medicine. And um, so I work uh, basically COO for the practice and then also um, yeah, doing academics, the uh, research and training. So that's us. Fantastic. No, we're really glad to have you. This is a very popular topic. A lot of different clinicians in different disciplines, you know, are interested in this topic because it's complicated, <laughs> as we will find out as we discuss it further. And uh, we're really looking forward to your insights. So the article that we specifically chose that was relevant to your practice um, is on visual vertigo and binocular vision dysfunction. So um, we're gonna get into that article a little bit and uh, talk about some different insights related to that. And we're grateful to the researchers who wrote this article, uh, including um, Dr. Pavlo, who's an excellent uh, researcher and uh, has looked at visual vertigo treatment over time. And I've read quite a few of uh, her articles, as well as the other folks listed on here are all excellent. So we're glad for that. So first, let's define visual vertigo. Um, so this is also known by other terms. Yeah, I like to joke that in the vestibular world, it's not uncommon for um, vestibular uh, conditions to have multiple names as well as the treatments can have multiple names. So it's a little tricky, uh, but visual vertigo is also known as visually induced dizziness. I've also heard it described as um, a visual motion sensitivity. Um, some other terms you might hear um, are patients who are kind of describing dizziness they might feel disoriented. It's not necessarily always a, a spinning type dizziness. It might just be more kind of disorientation. They might feel unsteady. Um, and all of these symptoms or whatever they have from these symptoms is kind of provoked by viewing either a visual vestibular conflict. And a good example of that would be uh, people in a car trying to read a book. So I'm reading a book, I'm looking at the letters, the letters are not moving, <laughs> they're still on the page, but you know, my vestibular system says I'm moving forward in this car, right? I'm riding in this car, moving forward. So that's one example of a visual vestibular conflict. Um, but you know, some people perceive patterns as being conflicting, checkerboards or stripes, um, people who just don't like what we'll call busy environments. So. Uh, a grocery store aisle is a great example. There's tons of stuff on the shelves, all the different colors and words and shapes. And so there's a lot of visual input there. Um, and, you know, it's complicated even in these scenarios because lighting also can be an issue for some folks, different types of lighting, although that's not part of visual vertigo. It's one more sensory input. Um, and it can be, you know, a, a visual motion is an issue. So maybe it's not necessarily a static pattern, um, such as a, a big uh, pattern stripes or something, but it might be more uh, visual motion. So examples there would be a train going past or a car pulling up next to you. Um, maybe you're brave enough to ride a roller coaster, although I'd say most people with visual vertigo would avoid those things. Um, so that would be a, certainly a strong visual motion where you really kind of have some self motion or motion around you um, specifically is kind of the big provoker here. Um, so that's how we define visual vertigo. And I think, you know, being in the visual world, Debbie, 
uh, I was wondering on your end, you know, if patients describe sensitivity to visual motion, um, if there's anything that you want to add to that description or does that kind of fit what you've experienced as well? I could add a couple more. Um, windshield wipers are, are torturous to my patients or snowflakes coming at them on the windshield. Um, they're always sensitive to tiny movements in, the, in any kind of space, even if they're standing there talking to an individual and watching their mouth move. Even just that concentrated task of focusing on a conversation can make them feel unsteady. Great. And one other, driving, um, take it, it's, it's not quite sunset or sunrise, it's just a little bit past, so the sun's pretty low and uh, there's no real leaves on the trees, so you're getting all kinds of shadows across the road. And as you drive, it's essentially, it's essentially uh, simulating optokinetic stimuli. So you're getting, and that can be a pretty bad trigger too. Definitely those shadows with the trees. I have heard that report as well. Great thoughts there. So, you know, with this visual vertigo issue, um, their theories on kind of why people might feel this way with this kind of stimulus abound. Um, but one common theory is that there is uh, an over-reliance on visual cues, both per for perception, meaning where am I in space, where is everything else in relation to you know, e each other, these objects in the environment around me, and then postural responses, right? Am I able to kind of keep myself centered? I know where I am in space, and I can orient myself to midline to stay balanced. Um, so another term you'll hear that's related to this over-reliance on visual cues is visually dependent. Um, so a lot of folks, you know, tend to trust their vision, um, even if they have visual correction with glasses or contacts. It, it's a natural thing for our brains to say, oh, yes, I am going to use vision to tell me what's going on around me, right? So when people have um, kind of, uh, what do they call them, kind of visual... Um, stimuli that are meant to confuse the brain, like these different puzzles you see, like, is it a woman or a vase and that kind of thing. It can be very difficult because folks are really used to saying, yep, I see this, you know, object in front of me and that's what it is. And <laughs> I'm going to use that visual information to tell myself, you know, what's going on around me. Um, but we are, you know, a multi-sensory um, system. So we do have vision. We have our inner ear vestibular system. Um, which is supposed to help us know where we are in space as well as if we're moving or not. And then our somatosensory system, which is inside our body, all of our joints, uh, muscle spindles, things like that have sensation that can tell us, again, what, where we are. Am I leaned? Am I not leaned? My joints and, and sensory system from uh, kind of the muscles can tell me that. So what's supposed to happen is all that information gets gathered and parts of the brain kind of integrate that information. So you'll hear this term sensory integration. Um, and then the output there would be, you know, us be able to kind of know where we are, us being able to, you know, walk and move and have balance and um, kind of coordinate our head and body movements, our eye movements, all these things are supposed to work as a team. <laughs> um, we'll talk more about teaming and <laughs> when things are not working as a team, what that's like. Um, so, you know, there are some theories about kind of what goes wrong when, but all I can say for sure here is that, you know, there's this theory that, you know, in the folks with visual vertigo, it seems that they tend to really heavily wait or kind of attend to visual information. Um, so much so that it's like kind of overkill. And so people can get dizzy when there's a lot of visual input at once because it's like, how do I attend to everything <laughs> at once? And so it kind of, I use the term confuses the brain in a way because it's hard to handle all that, you know, kind of high value sensory input instead of kind of attending to what would be relevant and kind of um, kind of putting aside or filtering is what I like to use the term, kind of attending uh, less to certain input that's maybe not relevant at the moment. I need to worry about that one cereal box, but not the person down the aisle that's not even close to me, <laughs> right? So... Um, is that anything to add on visual dependence from your knowledge base? Well, when the eyes aren't working well together, my patients often describe glancing more at the ground because if they look too much straight ahead, 
it's disorienting for them. So they find ways to just ground watch for stability. And as I look at it, you're talking about over reliance on visual input or visual cues. And I actually think from a perspective that we may chat about later with regards to our work with vertical heterophoria, it's really a case of visual distraction. That is, the visual system is not functioning as it should. It isn't fusing as well as it should. Um, the peripheral vision in particular is not overlapping like it should. And therefore the signaling that's coming away from this or going towards the brain is funny, staticky, unhappy signaling. And I think it ends up getting more attention than it ought to. And in that way, it's dominating the conversation, not because the system wants to listen to it, but because the system can't help but having to listen to it. Um, and the reason we come up with that kind of thinking is that when we use the microprism lenses, which we'll get about, talk about later, it gets better really fast. So, you know, something that's that speedy makes me think that something major isn't broken in the brain, that this is a garbage in, garbage out scenario. Right. And I think you, you kind of alluded to a really important point here which you know, is not anything that a new clinician wants to hear. At least I remember being that way and thinking, oh no, it's the old, it depends, right? So a person with visual vertigo um, might have a, a, an eye misalignment issue like you're referring to. And so that kind of you know, garbage in situation with the visual input is not kind of helping or is causing more distraction. But we, there's probably a subgroup potentially in my mind of people with visual vertigo where it's more that the vestibular system has had an issue. They had a study um, that looked at people with vestibular neuritis and those with persistent symptoms greater than six months, um, you know, kind of had a much higher scoring on their uh, objective testing for visual uh, dependency as they measured it with a, a rod and disc test, they call it. But anyway, the point is, is that, you know, for that group, it's maybe more that that vestibular system is, is putting in not great information. And so the brain, you know, is maybe kind of tipping over into attending to visual cues, which are in that case, hopefully good cues that they don't also, <laughs> hopefully they don't have both uh, a peripheral vestibular issue and an eye element issue. Although we'll talk about how that's possible, but you know, it may be kind of multiple potential causes uh, of the similar symptom or same symptom. Um, and that's where this could, can get very tricky. <laughs> All right. So Virgil Vertigo, um, according to this article, may be a trait that is enhanced or acquired, meaning that maybe somebody's, some people are kind of born that way. Other people might kind of develop it later on due to various issues with their sensory system. Um, and this is kind of what I just referred to already with this kind of example of folks with visual dependence who had had a history of a inner ear inflammation that caused damage to one of their inner ears. Um, if they have persistent symptoms, they're much more likely to be found to be visually dependent. So it can be sometimes chicken and egg questions too, right? Is someone, you know, visually dependent uh, more likely to um, have trouble reweighting their sensory inputs when an inner ear issue occurs? Um, or is the inner issue, your ear issue occurring, causing the person to switch to more uh, attending to their visual uh, inputs? So it's, it's definitely more research, as always, needs to be done in this area, which we'll talk about more. Um, but it, it is certainly an interesting con concept to think about how these sensory systems come together and, and all the things that can go wrong, unfortunately, in that process, right? Um, so now we get to turn to you all's uh, area of expertise, not mine, <laughs> but I hope I did a good job of finding good definitions to get everybody on the same page who's watching. Uh, we want to talk about binocular vision dysfunction as well in this article. So according to the Neurooptometric uh, Rehabilitation Association, binocular vision dysfunction occurs when two uh, persons, two eyes, are not aligning properly. Uh, so one is too high or too low or um, going ex uh, deviating out or deviating in um, when it shouldn't, um, or sometimes both eyes are, <laughs> are misaligned. But generally, you know, we're definitely seeing things are not lining up. They're not working as a team. And this can occur um, through brain injury, stroke, tumors. Um, sometimes it's a congenital issue, which they call something that you're born with, but that 
was not a problem for you in the past, but becomes a problem. And I'm going to ask you more about that in a second, but um, there are also times where they don't know why this is happening um, in an adult, that they start to have a misalignment. Um, so uh, in your experience, um, I think that the injuries kind of make sense, but um, could you talk a little bit about folks who, you know, um, seem to be uh, doing fine and then all of a sudden in their 40s, maybe 50s? When do you usually see where the eyes are no longer able to work as a team, even though they were doing so prior? And maybe touch on that a little bit more for us. Sure. So in the 40s, 35 and older, uh, our inability to focus as well at near begins to play a role. And, you know, patients aren't being corrected for the near vision. They, they struggle with scrolling on a computer. They scroll with all the intense screen work that people are doing. And maybe they had an underlying misalignment they could compensate for. But with this inability to focus and the misalignment, it's sort of like a double whammy. And things just tip into symptoms of, I have to take a break. I have to look away. I can't stay at the screen. I have to walk up and walk away from the screen or they start to close an eye or cover an eye. So they just begin to realize there's something going on visually, but sometimes literally the brain goes right to anxiety. I don't feel safe because when you think about anxiety and dizziness, most of my patients have underlying anxiety because they don't feel safe in space, wherever that space might be. So they just associate it with, I'm an anxious person, I have to go see a psychologist or therapist. And very often, every, occasionally they'll say, you know what, I feel better when I just don't do all that close-up work. So I'm going to take a lot of breaks. And then eventually, hopefully they come in for care and, and get the right correction. Um, so those are the kind of things. I've also had patients, interesting enough, have cataract surgery. The newest thing is to give one eye for far and one eye for an ear. And that's a disaster. And anytime you take the eyes and make them do different things at different focal lengths, there's no synchronization that's natural anymore. So you've all, I've had people go back to the cataract surgeon and they say, I'm dizzy after that surgery. And they say, oh, just go see the ENT. <laughs> Meanwhile, they were not dizzy before the surgery, but now they're dizzy after. Uh, there's all, they're also putting multifocal implants in the eyes. Well. All of us who are bifocals know they have to be perfectly aligned, but if they're putting them inside the eye, you're done. You can't fix that misalignment if they're inside the eye. So these are things I tell my patients to sort of look out for when they're about to have that kind of procedure. Make sure you keep them to distance vision corrections for far each eye. And then just to go back to the origins of your question, um, and it's a little bit, you asked a trick question. I'm not sure you knew that or not. <laughs> but did you ask about, you know, at that age, what happens? And the reality is, is that sometimes it's happening much earlier. It's just not being recognized. So, you know, yeah, my neck hurts. It always hurts. And I got my head tilted, but that's okay. And yeah, I get headaches sometimes, but that's my sinuses. And, you know, it, over years, they've had these various and sundry symptoms that was never associated with their vision. Then all of a sudden, you know, they get 35 or 40, their vision gets blurry and hot, must be my eyes at that point. But really they were symptomatic prior to that and they didn't know it either. Um, I think it's fair to say that you have a large uptick in the mid thirties going towards 40, but yeah, some of these are unrecognized cases as well. All right. Uh, yes, I love trick questions because you guys would never get tricked. So it's good, <laughs> but it's helpful for clinicians who wouldn't know what you just said either, right? Uh, very good. All right. So we'll talk about some definitions for folks who aren't familiar uh, with these eye alignment issues. So atropia, for those who don't know, is something that I have seen defined as something that is, quote, always there, even when both eyes are open. Um, and you might detect it with this cover uncover test. If it's not a, a huge align misalignment, I would hope anyone, <laughs> even a non-expert or a non-clinician could see where one eye is like, way out to the side or way up, right? Um, we don't necessarily need to do a test for that, although um, people might, you know, do more assessment, of course, but um, it would be obvious kind of upon just viewing the person. Um, and then aphoria they define as a, a misalignment that only occurs some of the time 
and that you might detect it with a cross cover test. So I'm going to go right in and then we'll ask you more about these things. Um, so a cover on cover test, as I understand it, is where you'd put an occluder, which could be your official eye occluder, or some people just do the old hand um, <laughs> uh, as a convenient tool in the ER, for example. Um, and so you're covering an eye and it's described where I've read it as to be two to three seconds. So we'll talk more uh, about options on that later. But um, kind of the traditional, I guess, is for just a few seconds. You're looking at the uncovered eye to see if it moves or shifts. Um, and they describe an example in the literature I was looking at that if you start by covering a right eye, you're looking at the left eye to see if it's shifting the moment that you cover the other eye. You repeat that a couple times just to make sure you don't miss anything or um, maybe something could happen, you know, subtly um, that you just want to kind of draw it out a little and then you do the same thing covering the other eye. Um, and put on the cover on cover test. So while it was taught to us in school, unless those increments are on the larger side, it's sometimes hard to actually see subtle misalignments that way. So just to give you something that we sometimes will have patients try where they can perceive it, not I have to perceive it, but they see it, is to stand five feet from a doorknob and take their own hand and go back and forth. And they literally can see the image jump up and jump down and jump up and jump down. That might be a way to see a vertical that's hidden. So yes, the cover and cover test is done and when it's a more of a gross test, then you might be able to see things. But the concern is, what if it's just so subtle? And they say, no, you're fine. And then they think there's nothing to do about it. So. That's my only caveat with that test. It's sure, it's, it's a, a very, you know, sh micro prism need, you won't see it. Right. Just going back to the definition slide a moment ago between um, phoria and tropia, there's also that you, you defined what we might see, but what the patient sees with a tropia is double. And what they see with a phoria is anything from fine to blurred to shadowed to intermittently double, but they're not consistently doubled. And why is that? Because it's a continuum and one end of the continuum is flat out normal and the other end of the continuum is flat out double or tropia. And heterophoria is fighting like crazy not to see double. So it's kind of in the middle, if you will. So as you go over some of these other tests, they're really good, or at least they are at their best, the tropias. But the caveat also could be, what if somebody's had this double vision for so long they suppress? Mm. So they may not even describe double vision. And here you see the eye is pointing in a completely different direction. No, I don't see double. So they are completely that. suppressing the image. Right. Um, and I think, you know, when I learned these tests, the cover on cover and the cross cover, uh, you know, they taught us as like a gross screening for like, oh, if they have like a major stroke, you might see uh, what they called a skew deviation, which I'm sure you all are, are familiar with that term as well. Um, and so, you know, I think you bring up a good point that, uh, you know, it's limited, limited utility, which doesn't make it no utility, right? Um, but certainly not giving us uh, all the answers. All right, so this was just a visual example for folks who love pictures. <laughs> um, you know, the idea of covering one eye um, and then seeing if the other eye shifts. So um, showing the different terms. I didn't want to dig too deep into the terms um, of uh, all the different, uh, different descriptions depending on if something, if an eye is turned inward, the ESO, if it's turned outward, it's EXO. Uh, vertical uh, al misalignment is termed typically hyper. Um, do I have all of that right based on what I had read? Okay. All right. Um, and that can apply to tropias or phorias. So the alternate cover or cross cover test, the way that I've learned it, you are covering uh, one eye. And you mentioned the term fusion, but I did want to define that for folks who's not, who are not familiar. Fusion is when the eyes are both able to view at the same time. They're in light and they're open. Um, and so the eyes are supposed to, again, be 
uh, taking their inputs and making a single image. Um, and so when we break fusion, that's when we typically would kind of not allow the eyes to work together. Do I have that definition correct, fusion? Breaking fusion? Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, so we break fusion and then we switch, right? So we're using it, uh, one or both hands or occluders, whatever you're using. Um, and you're looking at the eye that was just uncovered to see if we're getting uh, a shift. And so you both pointed out um, that both of these could draw out atropia, but are not likely to draw out aphoria. Do I have that correct? You could find a high foria, um, and usually we cover it like this. We go back but, and forth as opposed to changing, because that would be confusing. So just going back and forth um, and watching the movement of the eyes as you do it. That's great. Thank you. All right. So into this article a little bit more, now that we have some baseline definitions that we're all in agreement on, <laughs> uh, we can talk about the primary aim of the study which was to compare the presence and severity of visual vertigo symptoms at baseline and then pre and post treatment. And we'll talk about what that treatment was shortly. Um, looking at changes in scores of the visual vertigo um, measures that they used um, in folks with kind of non-resolving vestibular symptoms, um, ones that are difficult to resolve, they didn't resolve spontaneously in other words, with and without a binocular vision dysfunction or abnormality. So they took, uh, they started with 60 subjects, although I know later on it, it whittled down to 30 some as it does in many studies. <laughs> um, and the inclusion criteria you see listed here, people with peripheral vestibular disorders, uh, dizziness or unsteadiness lasting at least two months, um, adults essentially between 18 and 80, and they had done vestibular rehab with partial or no improvement. So the patients that were excluded were ones with central nervous system involvement, um, although they did include folks with vestibular migraine. Um, they excluded people with fluctuating symptoms, such as an active Meniere's case, um, any major physical issue that would affect balance or gait because the measures they used that would kind of conflict on uh, looking at progress and, and then an inability to attend, of course. And then those with severe migraine or untreated severe depression, they also excluded. So they did a bunch of neurotologic testing, which you can see listed here. And I did define what those tests were a little bit for those who are not familiar, but I'm not going to read all that out. Suffice to say, they were just kind of trying to identify uh, folks with clear um, inner ear issues or findings. Um, and there were some folks who um, still had issues, like for example, they had vestibular migraine as defined by the Baronite criteria, uh, but they didn't necessarily have any abnormal findings on these tests, uh, but they still included them because they uh, were otherwise defined as people with visual vertigo that met their criteria. So I, a side note here that I wanted to ask you all about was that they defined three patients as having a motorist disorientation syndrome. I have to confess that's something I'd never heard of before. And I always love it when I find things that I've never heard of. So I'm like, what is going on there? I want to learn more. Um, so they defined it as um, patients with dizziness, disorientation, nausea, and or unsteadiness, along with an illusion that the car is veering off course when driving on an open road. Uh, particularly when going around curvy bends, this is a very specific definition, I would add, <laughs> over the brow or descending a hill, I think brow must be some sort of UK term, and at faster speeds, <laughs> greater than 40 miles per hour. So uh, I wanted to know if you all are familiar with this, uh, any kind of quick thoughts on it. I just thought it was super interesting. Isn't that cool that got a name for it? Mm -hmm. There is a, one of the free, most frequent Google searches to our office is anxiety on highways or interstates. And it just means that when these two eyes are not working together, we're picking up on things in our peripheral vision, disorienting us. Now, if I had to maintain my position on the road straight ahead, I'd probably be okay. But you, now you add a bend in the, in the road and now if my eyes aren't working together, one eye might travel that way, the other eye is slower to come around. So it just creates severe disorientation. And very often my patients start 
to having a panic attack. And they actually pull off the road with their heart beating fast and they can't make it the rest of the way home. They often have to be picked up. So I would say this is a, a nice term that sort of gives you an idea of what's going on. And usually they talk about not just curved roads, but bridges and roll, rolling hills and something that's just not straight and easy to maintain the focus on. And the speed is that flicker frequency again in your peripheral vision that just throws them off and creates almost like a spin and a digital spin. Yeah, so it's a symptom, not necessarily its own. I mean, in other words, there's usually a root cause, we'll say, which sounds like uh, in your experience is almost always uh, an eye misalignment issue. Although I suppose there are probably those outlier pure anxiety cases where these specific things might drive up someone's um, anxiety. Does that seem accurate? Yeah. They describe that they can do the slow roads. They can do the back roads because they can manage the speed better without too much visual input that they can't manage. But don't take them in that road that's going at a higher speed because I think it's that, again, flicker frequency in their peripheral vision that starts to, you know, if my eyes are doing this or pointed together, I'm okay. But if I'm picking up on this little bit of subtlety of, disorientation where one eye travels out a bit or one eye travels in. Now they're not working together at all. So all that's going to become a trigger for me. Uh, so that's what they describe. And just going back to the original question, in our experience, this is mostly a symptom associated with what we're finding, which is these subtle misalignments. Um, we do own a lot of hammers, so we do find a lot of nails. But having said that, what you said earlier too, is that there's more than one reason that people have issues. And I'm sure there's other explanations for this, but in our clinic, this is a pretty prominent uh, cause and effect relationship. Makes a lot of sense. All right. I like it. Okay. So uh, the binocular vision assessment described in this article uh, was lengthy and I'm not going to dig into it too much because it feels like it could be a whole hour discussion. <laughs> um, but I pulled out a sentence here that I saw that said um, that the abnormality that um, the abnormalities that they defined as abnormalities, I guess, where they were kind of identifying was particular tests. They described reduced stereopsis um, mm -hmm. on the Frisbee stereoacuity test, which I think I found a good picture of <laughs> off to the right. Um, She's got some sort of like little squares with patterns on them and there's a stick involved. I'm going to let you get into that in a second to help me out because that's definitely new to me as well. Um, they described double vi vision at near fixation, uh, an abnormal head posture with reduced field of binocular single vision. So again, I don't want you to explain every test in there because again, I think that would unfortunately exceed our timing here, but maybe you could just kind of describe um, the stereopsis test and why that may have been, or maybe in your opinion, not been useful um, in identifying folks with binocular vision abnormalities. Many of our patients uh, struggle with depth perception and that's again, based on where the eyes are pointing in space. So if they're completely synchronized, we'll have good depth perception. If they're not quite um, functioning as a team, we'll have poor depth perception. So sometimes some of these tests, you can sort of get around them by looking at the circle that's floating towards you. I don't find they're always as helpful as we'd like to be. They can sort of get around it by other cues, even monocular cues, but it is one assessment. Uh, certainly seeing double at near is, is a problem. Two eyes are not working together. Um, in our work, we talk about NPD. Instead of near point of convergence, we talk about near point of discomfort. So as the patient's watching an object coming towards their nose, they actually get sometimes a little dizzy, a little nauseous. So they can actually get some symptoms you wouldn't expect just by, by focusing it near on an object. And just going back to the Frisbee, we don't use that one here, but we do use something called Randot, which I think achieves the same thing. Um, and it, it's a depth perception test. Um, and we use polarized lenses to help with this assessment. Um, it's out of nine, 
And if you have perfect death perception, you'll be nine out of nine. Our patients on average, if I remember right, ran around three and a half. Um, it's either three or four, but when I do the averages on a bigger series. And when we worked with them, we had an acute change of about doubling. We could get them to go from three and a half circles to about seven circles. So out of nine. So it's definitely part of the binocular vision issue. And I don't think it's a bad test overall. Debbie's right about the individual uh, person. It may not be accurate, but I think as a group statistic, it tends to work. Got it. And um, I, I imagine you do quite a, a thorough assessment. Um, but for those of us who have never seen a binocular vision assessment as you would do it, uh, Debbie, what do you think are kind of your, I don't know, somebody said, all right, you got 10 minutes and you can only look at two things or three things. What kind of are, are your standout tests that, that help give you the best information just because, um, you know, those of us who aren't familiar with any of those tests? So I would say, you know, doing the near point of convergence is important, one, but even going back to the acuity, check each eye individually, both at far and at near. You can have somebody who doesn't need prism at all, but their eyes are so far off, just by equalizing the quality of the image, you'll have somebody be able to get rid of many of their symptoms. So standard visual acuity, far and near is important. We're going into the near point of discomfort test is an important one. Um, you know, when you're doing the cover test, if you put a red, gleam, red lens on one eye and nothing on the other eye, a dot at the end of the room, you can start to see some differences between the alignment. Um, we do at least 13 other tests. So there's many, many tests. And do I have favorites? Some, some give me different kinds of information than other things. But working in free space is and oftentimes very helpful. Uh, your, your audience might be familiar with a Maddox rod. Uh, using a Maddox rod with a pen light may not tell me exactly the increment of misalignment, but it'll show a trend. So if you've got the pen light here, the Maddox rod showing you a high line, the line, the red line created by the Maddox rod is above the dot. If you see that trend on all the nine positions of gaze, you're having a sense of a directional misalignment. So, but again, because we do vertical and horizontal, we must do all of our array of tests to really get good information. Also gait assessment. When we watch them walking down the hallway and we have this pretty flower to look at when they're walking, the goal is just walk as if you're about to meet a friend. And you'll often see them just veering off to the right or veering off to the left. And that usually is accompanied by a tilt of the head. Our head is heavy. It's off to one side. It actually sort of pulls me off to that side. Occasionally, we'll get patients who actually show you a serpentine gait. Oftentimes, that's indicative of a single muscle weakness. So, and then we have a supermarket walk where we have to look right, we have to look left. And so if they're really strong and you can't even see their drift, I ask them to do that supermarket walk, not only you engage in the vestibular system, but you actually may pull them off to the side that they are going to drift to. That starts to tell us about where are we gonna to start to apply prism, which is the weak eye or the eye of interest. So it all gets folded into a sequence of analysis that then tells me, this is what I think is going on with their visual system. Right, because by itself, just having them walk and if they veer, that's not, telling you they definitely have an eye misalignment issue, right? You're taking that as one piece of, of your data, just the way that we do the same, having them walk as well and turn their head. But of course, we're usually screening out for vestibular issues, which also can create some of those same deviations. So very interesting. All right. So the vestibular assessment that I can speak to, uh, they, uh, in this study, they asked the patients to fill out a situational characteristics questionnaire. Um, and I'll show you an example of a couple of questions shortly on that. Those are designed to draw out the common reports of folks who have visual vertigo symptoms. Um, they also utilized a vertigo symptom scale, the Bex Exandia and Depression Inventory, uh, computerized dynamic posturography, which is where you're standing in a machine and the floor might tilt or the walls might shift and just kind of trying to draw out um, again, which systems you might be using or not using as much for balance. Um, and you do get some objective measures of, of postural sway and things like that. 
and then our functional gait assessment, which is a, a very well validated dynamic um, standing balance with, with gait, walking, walking and turning the head, um, so walking with your eyes closed, things like that. So some good challenges there. So the uh, situational uh, characteristics questionnaire, a vertigo questionnaire, a couple of example questions, uh, riding as a passenger in a car. <laughs> so these are going to ring true and familiar to our folks with binocular vision uh, dysfunction as well, uh, but that's okay. Um, it's just really designed to kind of help identify what types of stimuli um, kind of are creating um, some different symptoms for patients. Um, and then, you know, we use it at least in vestibular therapy as a way to mark ideally progress. <laughs> um, so if I have somebody who's coming in and they're reporting a lot of, you know, these issues, and then we do some uh, different vestibular care that we would normally do for some of these patients and that number improves, hey, hopefully something's <laughs> helping that we're doing and uh, that would be something we would look at. So, um, the intervention that they did not go into detail on, but apparently that was described in another article, which folks can certainly look at on their own. Um, but the summary that I saw was patients are using what we call optokinetic or visual motion stimulation type videos. Um, and they performed 13 two minute sessions um, and use some eye and head and movement exercises with those, which vestibular therapists would probably be familiar with things like looking at one object and then moving your eyes and switching your head and or looking at a single object and turning your head, which we called VOR exercises for the vestibular ocular reflex. So these different kind of common exercises we use in vestibular rehab um, with kind of these, what we'll call busy motion backgrounds. Um, and they, you know, graded them out the way you should. You don't want to start, you're not going to start every patient at the same <laughs> level of challenge, depending on how they present, what they tolerate. Um, and of course you can change the position, which also changes the challenge. Um, you know, whether you're sitting, standing, walking and what direction of head movements you're using. So these are all things that vestibular therapists who are watching are probably like, oh yeah, I know all about that stuff, right? So that was pretty well what they were applying um, to treat. So with all these patients, the only thing that seemed to really stand out um, at the end was that the patients who, who benefited did not have binocular vision abnormalities <laughs> and the patients who uh, did have those abnormalities did not seem to improve um, on their report of symptoms for visual vertigo symptoms. Um, and both groups did improve things like balance, um, and other kind of general vestibular symptoms like dizziness. So it was really about this kind of visual stim environment. That was kind of the differential where, you know, they, the group with binocular vision dysfunction, they still had the same issues with visual vertigo. Okay. That's in this study. So um, the conclusion here, one of the conclusions that was made uh, was that clinicians such as physical therapists can assess and screen uh, for the presence of binocular abnormalities in patients with visual vertigo. And if we find an abnormality, then we should be referring <laughs> uh, to uh, their definition was ortho-optic and ortho -ophthalmic Oh, I hate that word, <laughs> assessment. Um, yep. So kind of eye health and eye function as I think of them, um, you know, doctors, right? So the kind of general recommendation there. So let's talk about y'all's work more. So um, I am aware that you have some alternative screening tools as opposed to the cover, uncover and alternate cover test that uh, someone uh, such as a physical therapist or even a neurologist or anyone who's not a neurooptometrist, I'll just say, uh, could use this tool um, or recommend that a patient use this tool um, to kind of help screen them better for the possibility of eye misalignment issues. Um, so the questionnaire in, uh, we're talking about is called the Binocular Vision Dysfunction Questionnaire, or BVDQ, if you like those abbreviations. <laughs> and my understanding is it's 25 questions. The maximum score is a 75, and the minimum score would be a zero. High scores are bad, <laughs> meaning you're more likely, you know, you're playing, reporting symptom and possible sense of dysfunction. Um, and a score of 15 or greater 
indicates a possible binocular vision dysfunction. So um, anything you want to add to that, please feel free. Um, just that it's the most, for us, it's the most powerful tool to identify patients with symptom burden who should be evaluated. And you can have people who minimize their symptoms and, you know, only score 17. But we also have something called the severity index, which is on the questionnaire and it's got what's your headache, what's your dizzy, what's your nausea, it's zero to 10. And they may have a a moderately low score on the BBDQ because they're minimizing their symptoms, but you look at their severity index and they can score quite high. So we always want to pay attention to the specific symptoms that they also have. But this BBDQ is quite helpful. We have it for adults, which we call 14 to, um, you know, infinity. 14 infinity. Yep. Uh, and then <laughs> 9 to 13 and four to eight. So we do have it for the younger children. I think that were, those were sent to you if you wanna distribute those. So this all kind of started from the concept of, well, who do you know how to take care of? You know, how, how do we know we should send them to you? You know, and you know, can you really help them? I mean, you, you just think you can, but do you have any tests in advance that'll kind of clue you in on the folks that you might be able to be doing some benefit for? Or are you just gonna waste everybody's time and money? That kind of a thing. So we've been collecting data for years and years and years on this, literally since 2000. So I can't do the math, but it's a while. And we ended up developing the questionnaire from that and uh, finally got validated 2020? 2021. 2021. So, you know, it's validated for screening for this condition. And it's you know, anecdotally, we'll tell you that it really does work. Um, people that have high scores, they really need to be evaluated for their binocular vision. And the vast, 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 vast majority of them indeed do have something going on with their binocular vision. Um, there's a differential on this where this will catch a few other types of people. We'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but they needed to be seen and figured out and sent to the right clinicians anyway. So if the score is high, they really do need this kind of an evaluation. When they score 40 or more, they stop sometimes driving on highways. They slow down their driving. They also can't work as fully. We start seeing scores of 50 and 60, they're becoming dysfunctional. Uh, they really can't do the job that they were doing or get to work uh, with the vehicle without feeling really afraid of getting in a car accident. So I think it's, it is a powerful tool. And I always encourage people, you know, they think their aunt might have it or their child might have it. I say, you know what? We don't even have to guess. Let's just have you fill out the questionnaire and uh, see how they score. So that might tell the clinician that they are likely candidate for care, but what we'll tell the patient, we use what we call the five minute cover test. So that's done by having the patient identify which side it's easier for them to go towards. So as you can see, I go a little easier towards my right shoulder. We also, if they have a chair with arms, ask them to lean on the right with their eyes closed, lean on the left, and see which side it's easier to lean on. And again, I can go here much easier. So that determines that my left eye is the high eye or the eye closest to the ceiling. And that's the one I'm gonna cover. So when I cover it, I'm looking at an eight foot wall or a, a, a wall, blank wall eight feet away. I, I cover that eye and I cover it for five minutes. Before I cover it, I, I put on a piece of paper. What's my dizzy, zero to 10? What's my nausea, zero to 10? What's my headache, zero to 10, and so on, neck ache. And we don't talk about imbalance of walking. They're usually seated during this test. But let's say they had headache and dizziness of eight out of 10, and they're doing their cover test. They set a kitchen timer. Timer goes off after five minutes. Before uncovering that eye, you ask them, now what's your headache? Now what's your neck ache? Now what's your nausea? those numbers go down by a third to a half within five minutes. And all that you've really done is not allowed them to use the two eyes together. And they usually feel once they uncover a little off because this was actually almost therapeutic, calming down their symptoms. And then you take it away and they'll feel all this a little worse. So that was proving, yes, this is a two-eyed problem. But it also depends with the caveat that the eyes have to be pretty well corrected 
for this test to work. You mean like good vision like 2020? Pretty good vision. So if I look far away and I'm looking at the binder of a book, it's pretty clear on this side, pretty clear on this side, you're good to go. But if you check your vision and they're quite different and they're not accurate and not clear on one side or the other, it may not work for the patient to use it as a valid test. That's really helpful. All right, so I'm going to show everyone a couple example questions on the BVDQ here and show you the rating. So it is a kind of a subjective rating, always, frequently, uh, which is defined as at least one time a week, occasionally less than one time a week, and never is never. So, <laughs> um, you know, hopefully a patient, you know, like any time they're filling out a questionnaire, they have to just try to think and use their memory and judgment and try to guesstimate, and that's true of any questionnaire, which does not make it uh, unuseful by any means, but just kind of taking that into consideration, right? Um, and you just covered this very well. I pulled this direct from your website. It was specific uh, in the description to headache, but clearly it can be other symptoms. Um, and you went into a, a bit more detail about kind of knowing which side to cover, which I didn't specifically see um, described there, but that was great input. So I appreciate that. So just another way to kind of screen uh, and see if eye alignment issues are contributing to symptoms. And uh, we're about to talk about treatment. But before I get to treatment, I actually do want uh, to go ahead and dig into those couple of types of patients that might pop up positive, if you will, or possibly having a binocular vision disorder that you end up finding don't, uh, and kind of, you know, what your next steps are with that group and, you know, what diagnoses they tend to end up having. Yeah. So you may identify that they actually have an inner ear condition and you're not diagnosing them by any means, but let's say they still have dizziness and you've done everything you can and they were not a positive responder to PRISM. We have what we call the top four questions in an SSCD questionnaire. This is all done again internally within our office. We are finding that some of these patients actually had a dehiscence, a canal dehiscence, so we started using a non-validated SSCD questionnaire in our office, 16 questions. So we have four of the top ones and we asked them those four when we first sent to the office. If they score two out of four, then we give them the full 16 questionnaire. And sometimes we can see them scoring 14 out of 16, which is again, suggestive of there being some kind of third mobile window defect. So. We do look at that and we know if we're not able to help them, we then may send them on to an ENT or in some cases to an otologist. The second thing that we often will look at is dysautonomia or POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And again, we have a questionnaire that's 24 questions. And in this, we again, give them the four top. And if two out of four they score, they say yes to, then we give them the full 24 questionnaire. And that's val not validated, but anytime they score 12 or more, again, they're suggestive of maybe having dysautonomy. We also do a, a 525 test. They lay down, we do blood pressure pulse. They, they're seated uh, two minutes, so it's five minutes laying down, blood pressure pulse. Seated two minutes, blood pressure pulse. Stand five, blood pressure pulse. Our pulse should go maybe 60 to 80 or 90, but not over 30 beat difference from uh, supine to standing. Many of these patients might go up over 100 or 105 or 110, even when they're just sitting there, their resting pulse can be 95 to 100. So again, those are suggestive of their being need for a referral to let's say an EP cardiologist, somebody who can really give them a good workup for dysautonomia. We're finding long haul COVID patients are actually getting dysautonomia. So, you know, that's where they're standing and they're feeling like they're, they're gonna pass out. So sometimes we even elevate their feet and recline their body and all of a sudden their symptoms just start to dissipate. So we do look at other things because it's not just eyes. There may be multifactorial reasons why people are coming uh, to be evaluated. Great, great points. All right, very good. So let's talk treatment. So everybody's hearing about these prisms, microprisms. What's the difference? 
Um, I understand that in general, prism lenses contain special types of lenses that correct the eye misalignment um, in patients that it would be appropriate for them to have them. Um, occasionally, people with significant eye misalignments do need surgery. I just want to note that to the group um, so that we don't think everything can be corrected with prisms. Um, <laughs> sometimes clinicians go that route. They go a little too prism crazy, and it's like, okay, like <laughs> prisms are a great tool for the right patient. Um, and they do bend light so that images, um, you know, are, are kind of draw, you're drawing the eye a certain way to, to get that alignment um, better to realign those images. And then the patient can see a singular image um, instead of this misalignment issue. So um, could you just speak very briefly, because we are tight on time, as I figured, it's so exciting to talk about this. Um, what When you say microprism, can you explain what that exactly means? Uh, most of our prescriptions are under two diopters, so it's anything of a, let's say, a smaller unit. And, um, you know, we work in quarters, so anything you know, with incrementally amounts that synchronize the images, and we always prove what we're doing by gait analysis. So maybe they did drift to the right or left, and with the proper prism on, they may maintain centered position in the hallway if it's just, again, visual. So it just means it's a smaller unit than we ever ta were taught in school. In the ophthalmological literature, they always said four diopters mattered, four or more. And uh, we actually found much smaller units make a huge difference. It can be, again, under that two diopter amount that can make a difference in our patients. So the vast majority of our prescriptions are under one diopter. Um, the trial kits, frequently don't have anything less than one diopter. We're working in quarter diopter. So fractional units of prism, I think, just micro, small amounts. Got it. That's very helpful. All right. So I didn't want to leave this discussion without touching on vision therapy. Uh, it's something that, you know, as a physical therapist, I've been told, oh, you've got somebody, say, post-concussion or stroke, and, you know, you notice some major ocular issues, um, you know, ocular motor dysfunction, we'll say, um, smooth pursuit doesn't look good, et cetera, saccades are all over the place, you name it. Uh, you might want to refer that patient out for an assessment to see if they would benefit from vision therapy. Now, it's definitely common um, in children for various reasons, um, but for the sake of this discussion, uh, I just would like to understand, number one, what types of patients do you recommend vision therapy to, and might some people have prisms and do vision therapy or kind of what's the deal there? You know, when I first graduated, I loved vision therapy and I did a fair amount of it. But when I started getting referrals from an ENT who wanted me to get these patients back to work, I had to get pretty creative. And he said, and by the way, they have no time for those exercises. So in my world, it was a fascinating journey to figure out how to get them more functional expediently. But in the world of vision therapy for those who work with very young children, they, it can certainly still be helpful. And even in our patients, everybody could benefit by you know, some kind of therapy of that sort. Uh, but when we're looking to eliminate symptoms quickly, I, I took a different path. But I do have a lot of colleagues that I have trained who were first trained in vision therapy and then they learned our technique and they absolutely use both. Um, in the adults, they often start with our technique. In the children, they may start with vision therapy. And then if, it, if they're not successful or they find the child can come for twice a week therapy sessions or the cost might be difficult for them, uh, they may explore the idea of using PRISM for those patients. Got it. That's very helpful. All right. So um, I did want to make sure everybody's aware there are lots of resources on Dr. Feinberg and Dr. Rosner's website, which is Vision Specialists of Michigan. And you see the website listed there, which you could Google it up as well. So we all do that nowadays. And um, you'll see that there uh, is free access to that BVDQ for those different age groups, as well as wonderful educational resources that go into detail about different aspects of binocular vision dysfunction beyond what we've discussed today. And of course, you can follow them on their various social media platforms. Um, also, Vestibular Disorders Association, or VEDA, uh, vestibular.org, 
wonderful website there that has some nice resources, including <laughs> a nice article by uh, Dr. Feinberg on uh, binocular vision dysfunction. Um, so you can access the articles. I made some short links because they were quite long. <laughs> um, so hopefully folks can uh, screenshot this or grab this uh, for their own, you know, kind of further edification or to utilize different resources for educating patients. Uh, take home message on my end is screening for binocular vision dysfunction is critical in any patient with visual vertigo, especially someone who is not progressing as expected with vestibular rehab um, for this visual vertigo symptom, uh, which of course could be someone with a variety of vestibular diagnoses, whether it's migraine or uh, the peripheral vestibular issues. Um, the article did not discuss people with visual vertigo who have had strokes and other conditions that were excluded. So I don't know how to speak to that except to say, um, from my understanding, the binocular vision dysfunction questionnaire is still valid um, across various folks with various types of diagnoses. Um, so if you have concerns about possible eye alignment issues, you could try that with them um, to see if they could benefit from further assessment. Um, so not only can we use this binocular vision dysfunction questionnaire, but we could use that five minute cover test as described by Dr. Feinberg. And we don't have to limit ourselves to a cover on cover or a cross cover <laughs> test. Um, and as far as treatment, uh, it definitely can be appropriate for these patients. It can help really change their lives in you know, kind of reducing or even eliminating symptoms. And they may still need vestibular rehab. I think an easy example in my head is someone with concussion where they could have ocular issues, cervical issues, <laughs> vestibular issues, mood issues. So that's always to me uh, a potential need for multidisciplinary approach, uh, in which case um, binocular vision uh, dysfunction assessment and potential treatment could be one uh, you know, aspect of that multidisciplinary care for the right patients. Um, so we're ready to go to questions. We're just a little over time, but I think it did okay. Um, so let's switch to that and see what questions we have. So I have a question here. What low-tech diagnostic tools do you recommend for identifying phorias and tropias? So I think we've answered that question <laughs> with the binocular vision dysfunction questionnaire and the five minute cover test. What Actually, some... there's one other, oh, one other yeah. really low Go ahead. tool. It's called a history. So um, ask them if they're seeing double, ask them if they're seeing blurred, ask them if they're seeing streak kind of vision. Cause if they are, that's worthy. And you know what? Kids in particular, well, they won't tell you cause doesn't everybody see like this? And I can't tell you how many children we've had in clinic who we have issues with binocular vision and they see double and they never told anybody and nobody ever thought to ask them. So please just start with asking people if they're having any vision symptomatology. Um, it's a real fair way to go. And the gross stuff, the um, tropias, they'll be able to report that out. Great. All right. Another question we have here. What are some games or other clinical gems that you have discovered to help people keep patients engaged and focused during rehabilitation. So we'll focus on, uh, I guess, vision rehab here um, for patients who are appropriate for that. Um, what do you think you have on that? A little, some clinical gems, games and things. It's not really my area of expertise, um, you know, doing vision rehab in that way. So I'm sorry, I can't help with that. That's okay. Um, I don't know how worthy this is, but uh, when I'm trying to stimulate the vestibular system and work a little bit of ocular motor at the same time, which many of my patients do benefit from, um, although they're not necessarily reporting double vision and such, um, I use a game called Spot It, where every card has a match um, and there's multiple objects on each card. So it's a lot to kind of look at. And I have the patient hold those cards a bit apart. So they have to turn their head, which stimulates their vestibular system. And they're kind of visually scanning. Now, this would not be helpful to somebody who's not progressing, but I do have patients who have regular vestibular issues, but they do kind of need some stimulation like that. Um, so Spot It is definitely uh, one of my top favorites. Um, a lot of folks you'll see using kind of balls, tossing a ball, catching a ball, um, passing a ball from one hand to the other, that sort of thing is a way to stimulate movement. Um, you know, a lot of our traditional vestibular patients um, really just need like, 
they were so guarded, right? They don't want to move because they don't want to make themselves feel dizzy. So these are patients who, um, you know, if they don't have any eye alignment issues and it's just kind of more your straightforward patient, um, you know, we can certainly find different ways um, to work um, kind of their attention. So I like to do a lot of what they call dual tasking where they are having to kind of Maybe they're tossing a ball and they have to spell words, things like that. This literature is very supportive of activities like that. Um, and I have some familiarity with a whole other topic. This could be a whole separate hour on the kind of parvo magno, um, kind of peripheral vision versus central vision. And, you know, you may not have an eye alignment issue, but you might have trouble, um, as I have read at least, like kind of filtering or again kind of attending to whether we tend to periphery or we're tending to central so i've had somebody um you may be familiar with a marzen ball which is like a ball that can hang from a string and swings um, and there's letters on it so they have to kind of find different letters on it um alphabetical order or something like that and the ball is moving so they're maybe having to move or sway and kind of again stimulating movement that way um as well as working kind of the kind of saccades or scanning and finding objects. So just another way to kind of try to reintegrate sensory systems. Um, and that's kind of my approach, at least, for patients who, you know, do not need these <laughs> extra uh, really important uh, care that you all provide. But, you know, they just kind of need some of that. So hopefully that helps to answer the question that we got there. We have one other question. How would a patient incorporate use of her prism glasses and vision therapy? Can the vision therapy be performed with prism glasses? So I do have some colleagues that used to do, let's say, 12 sessions of vision therapy, and they found that as they started to learn this technique of using PRISM incorporated into their glasses, they only needed to do, let's say, a shorter number of sessions. So once the large amount of misalignment might be, or even whatever that misalignment is, gets incorporated into the glasses, they can then do a higher level. Uh, visual exercises to help those patients learn to use these two eyes as a team now that they are synchronized just to improve efficiency in the visual system. That's awesome. Uh, have you ever found that someone um, kind of weans away or, or no longer needs prisms? What does that look like? Yeah, I have had some patients that over time, it may happen over several years, they come back and they progressively say, you know what, I'm not so sure I feel as good with these on. And so we reassess everything and sometimes I'm able to reduce it. And sometimes in a rare couple of cases, I've actually been able to eliminate it. So I would say that, you know, we see people after head injury and as we know, the brain does do some incredible healing over time. And so some of that healing is away from the need for that visual orthotic they still need maybe a perfective correction, but in some cases they no longer need that prismatic correction. Those are, the, let's say, the smaller units of prism. Got it. All right, we've got one more question, and then we'll we'll definitely have to nip it in the bud here since we're over time. Um, we have a question here: What patients are best referred for neurovision rehab versus other types of vestibular rehab, in your opinion? Again, I think the definition of neurovision rehab isn't fully clear to me. Um, it's a new term, I think, vision rehabil neurovision rehabilitation. A lot of those colleagues who, let's say, used to do vision therapy exclusively are now doing more neurovision rehab. So I think that's where you get optometrists who are doing sort of like some of those eye exercises like you described, the Marsden ball and so on they might be now used for patients after a traumatic brain injury. The vestibular rehab may begin for your work where they're having, let's say, the dizziness and it's not going away with traditional glasses or with neurovision. They might need to see the vestibular rehab specialist like yourself. But if they came to us first, we'd screen them with the questionnaire. That would be our starting point. Um, and then we'd see if they, you know, how they did with an attempt at prismatic correction. You know, go through everything and see if they even have the misalignment, if prism's appropriate, and then kind of take it from there. If they're successful, that's the end point. If they're not, then for us, that would be where we would kind of make the, the decision on who to send where. Right. And I think, you know, just to kind of, oh, you want to add something, Dr. Feinberg? I just want to mention that we do have patients who get BPPV and after head injury, that's pretty common. So we do have um, you know, 
a person like yourself, a vestibular rehabilitation specialist, who we want to send out for the, the treatment and that protocol. Absolutely. And I think that's where, you know, there's a lot of different terminology. I like layers to the onion. So it's not unusual to have patients. Um, and again, concussion is just, I think, in some ways an easy example because it's unsurprising that they would have multiple deficits because of the way that you know, concussion occurs. Uh, but there are other patients who might come in, you know, with complaints and you find some vision issues and I find some vestibular issues and it's not like it has to be A or B, like it can be A and B. And so, you know, between the two of us, we can get that patient feeling pretty good. Um, and maybe one or the other could get them partway there. So it's just good to kind of, as a clinician to really have an open mind, um, and, you know, do your due diligence, of course, to do your own exam and then kind of try to figure out with things like the BBDQ, you know, what other needs um, might help this patient, especially if you're noticing, you know, kind of symptoms that are not addressable by whatever your tools are as your discipline is, right? And my favorite thing is calling us all a team of treaters. You know, when patients have a head injury, multiple systems do uh, sort of break down, if you will. So I think we, my favorite drawer next to my prism drawer is my referral drawer. <laughs> because this is the group that's going to get these patients the rest of the way better. Absolutely. All right. Well, on that end, I think we are going to close out the questions. And thank you so, so much for your time. And um, if anyone needs to reach out to this group, you saw the contact information on our other slide. Um, but it's Vision Specialists of Michigan. And if you're looking for someone who does their work in your area, there's a very nice um, find a provider um, aspect on the Vision Specialists of Michigan's website. Um, and if you have additional questions beyond that, um, they're very receptive, happy to help you and figure out what's your patient's next best steps. If there's not someone physically close to you, how can they find someone and, and is it kind of worth it to make them, you know, so to speak, travel or recommend that they travel to really get that specific kind of assessment that they would need? Because not every optometrist does this work. Like some optometrists are wonderful and their job is to, you know, make sure you have the right refraction or right glasses or contacts, but they're not specialized in this way. So we really need the specialists um, to look at these patients if we're concerned about these eye alignment issues, especially if they're subtle. So on that note, again, thank you all again, Dr. Rosner, Dr. Feinberg, you've been fantastic. And uh, we'll thank everybody else for joining us and we'll see you next month. Thank you, Helena. Thank really you so enjoyed much. it. Thanks.